how to best understand Nagarjuna is the main theme of the symposium. Whether we examine his reasoning, his theological project, uh, or the tools we use in reading his text, our purpose is, of course, to better understand him. But exactly how we come to this understanding will depend on what we mean by understanding Nagarjuna. Imagine that someone asks us to remain silent. Can we say that we understand her if we grasp the structure of her utterance, for example? If we realize the motivations behind her request? If we gain insight into the nature of silence? Or if we simply stop talking? Attempting to understand Nagarjuna is in some ways similar. It is one thing to understand the nature and structure of his arguments. It is another thing, although related thing, um, to understand how these arguments are used within the broader context of his worldview that is not limited to those arguments only. It is a different thing to form an idea of emptiness based on a broader, broader and deeper readings of his writings. And it's yet another thing to utilize his um, arguments and actually taste that emptiness he's talking about. Sharing with you some of the ideas provoked by the questions posted for the symposium and addressing different modes of understanding Nagarjuna, I'll focus primarily on the issue of understanding him with the help of interpretive tools that he himself did not explicitly articulate. My basic position, and I'll explain it below a little bit, is that while the view developed in Mula Madhyama Kakayaka invites the usage of interpretive tools other than those found in the text, um, it simultaneously challenges any attempts to use those tools. Let me begin by uh, stating something obvious. Depending on what text we attribute to Nagarjuna and how we understand their interrelationships, our understanding of Nagarjuna's Madhyamaka, Nagarjuna's philosophy, Nagarjuna's views, etc., as well as our answers to the questions posted for the symposium will vary. But even if we concede that Nagarjuna equals only the author of Mula Madhyamaka Kayaka. So from now on, I will be talking only about uh, the author of Mula Madhyamaka Kayaka. And focus just on that text. We can hardly ignore the fact that it contains multiple passages that refer to the soteriological framework in which his philosophy is embedded. And I can make references, but all of you know, right, so, um, that. Reading those passages leaves little doubt that Nagarjuna is a Buddhist thinker who accepts and pursues Buddhist principles and soteriological objectives. That, in turn, helps us better understand such elements of his philosophy as the rejection of views, propositions, theses, and so forth. For example, while he did not and could not maintain any position within the framework of negative reasoning that most of his text utilizes, he presented that reasoning as the very means of elucidating and engaging such Buddhist themes as the Four Truths, for example. In those parts of the text that do not focus on the negative reasoning per se, far from rejecting such principles as karma and nirvana, Nagarjuna presents his arguments as soteriologically useful means of destroying all grasping at those and other views and ideas, thereby eliminating karma and achieving nirvana. And yet, because his main focus was on the negative Matyamaka reasoning, Nagarjuna did not elaborate on such questions as how that reasoning works in the context of the path or marga leading to nirvana. How exactly one is supposed to maintain realization of emptiness based on that reasoning? How conceptual understanding based on reasoning transforms into direct insight into emptiness and so forth? Whether anticipated by Nagarjuna himself or not, such questions had to be asked sooner or later. After all, doesn't it just make sense, to use the lay term, um, to answer the question of how exactly his system works, is supposed to work, if he himself said that it does work? This is where later commentary on literature on Nagarjuna um, comes into play, and this is exactly what it does. Even Chandrakirti's Matyamaka Avatar, for example, places Nagarjuna's thought within the framework of the 10 stages and other elements of the Buddhist path. Studying such literature is indispensable for broadening our understanding of Nagarjuna because our exploration of his thought should not be limited to the structure of his arguments only, but has to extend to the way his thought works within the broader soteriological framework uh, he himself articulated. Nevertheless, reading Nagarjuna with an eye on soteriological dimensions of his thought poses the following problem. The Buddhist soteriological project can be understood only in terms of marga, right, or path to enlightenment. Marga, in their turn, have the nature of, or linked with, different transformative mental processes and states of consciousness. Because Mula Matyama Kakarika did not address those elements, 
in detail, particularly in Nagarjuna's uh, position on the process of realization of emptiness, his commentators eventually turned for help to systems of Buddhist epistemology. However, the very application of an epistemological vocabulary to Nagarjuna's thought uh, leads to tensions and problems of increasing complexity that Nagarjuna himself could hardly have anticipated. And while Muna Matyama Kakarika raises different issues involved in his approach to reality, his approach to reality, and Nagarjuna himself suggests solution to those issues, the same cannot be said about problems created by the application of epistemological tools not found in his text. For example, Nagarjuna's approach does create tension between negative and positive discourses in general, and negative and positive statements related to emptiness in particular. In chapter 18, he writes that ultimate reality is beyond words and mental objects. In chapter 13, he argues against those who treat emptiness as just another view. In chapter 24, on the other hand, he writes that dependent origination is explained as emptiness, that such is the middle way, and that the one who sees dependent origination sees the four truths of sufferings and so forth. Nagarjuna suggests a solution to that tension when in the same chapter 24 he writes that in their teachings, Buddhists relied on the two realities, ultimate and conventional, and emphasized the importance of conventions for realizing ultimate reality. He thereby provides his own solution to the problem of thinking about the unthinkable and conceptualizing the ineffable emptiness. Um, those who use epistemological tools in attempting to explain the realization of emptiness face similar problems of trying to conceptualize the direct realization of emptiness that is said to destroy conceptualization. Address a conceptual understanding of emptiness that allegedly takes as its subject that reality which transcends the subjective objective duality and so forth. Nevertheless, um, using Buddhist epistemological ideas is indispensable for articulating realization of emptiness within the framework of the Buddha, uh, Buddhist marga or path. Um, in this sense, it's similar to the need to use words and conceptual thinking for pointing at emptiness. The importance of this approach is acknowledged by Buddhist thinkers themselves, who rarely, rarely admit that Nagarjuna's theory of emptiness and epistemological theories <coughs> developed by such thinkers as Dharma Kirti, for example, are far from being a perfect match. In fact, we usually hear claims to the contrary, as can be judged from the Tibetan expression, um, the intertwined lines necks of Matyamaka and Pramana. Right. While d Buddhist thinkers hold different opinions on Dharmakirti's epistemology, Nagarjuna's views, uh, view of emptiness, and the combination of the two, the interpretations of Mula Matyamaka Karika have two important features in common. Explicit or implicit references to problems issuing from the combination of Dharmakirti's and Nagarjuna's projects, and creative ways of solving those problems that contribute to overall understanding of Nagarjuna. To illustrate this point, I want to draw your attention to one such interpretation that was developed by an important Tibetan thinker I'm working on, Shek Chukdan. It's 15th century thinker. Um, so you have one little passage here um, on your handout. So his approach is representative of the problems arising from attempts to combine the worlds of Dharmakirti and Nagarjuna. Problems that are especially apparent when one applies the terminology of conceptual mind, direct perception, inferential consciousness, and related epistemological terms to the process of realizing emptiness based on reasoning found in Mulamat Yamakakaya. On the handout, you will find a passage from Shek Student's commentary on the text in which he addresses an important question about the conceptual realization of emptiness or freedom from proliferations uh, triggered by Matyamaka reasoning. While combining Dharmakirti's and Nagarjuna's perspectives, as he understands them, he tries to ref uh, remain faithful to them both, in his mind, of course. For him to admit, for example, that mind realizing emptiness or freedom from proliferations, immediately triggered by Matyamaka reasoning, so we are talking about conceptual understanding of emptiness here, has any object at all, observes anything at all, will be unfaithful to Nagarjuna while to treat that mind as non-conceptual will be unfaithful to Dharma Kirti. I, I won't be discussing whether he is right or not and whether the whole um, approach of combining Dharma Kirti with Mula Matyama Kakarika is a good approach, but I'm using this passage as an illustration of the challenge faced by early and contemporary interpreters of Nagarjuna who use interpretive tools other than those found in Mula Matyama Kakarika. 
whether we're talking about uh, Buddhist epistemology, contemporary philosophy, and so forth. So what is the origin of that challenge? One of the reasons is the negative dialectics used by Nagarjuna for challenging and deconstructing dualistic thinking, that very thinking which one has to use for explaining Nagarjuna's negative dialectics. We might call it a trick his system plays on its interpreters as well as on itself. Paradox, perhaps, is a better term. It's also tricky to use words to expose the deceptive nature of words and to use concepts to destroy concepts. It is particularly problematic or tricky to say and think that the ultimate reality is beyond the reach of concepts and words and then proceed to thinking and talking about. Yet, I would also argue that precisely because of the tricky nature of Nagarjuna's philosophical project, if we want to reach understanding that his reasoning leads to, we do not have to understand his project at all. This is because while maintaining the familiar Buddhist soteriological framework, and actually as the very means of pursuing soteriological objectives, he is not trying to build a theory, but rather to de demonstrate the means of deconstructing all grasping at any theory whatsoever. If we want to do so, we likewise have to utilize his reasoning and travel the same path of deconstruction, instead of developing positive statements and constructing theories about his negative dialectics. While this approach is sufficient for the practical reason of destroying attachment to views, and such is one way of understanding Nagarjuna, it is obviously not sufficient for explaining the nature of his overall project. Perhaps we can say that to understand what Nagarjuna points at, we have to follow his dialectical lead. But to understand and explain Nagarjuna's project, we need something more than Nagarjuna's dialectic. This is what his interpreters did, and this is exactly what we are trying to do. So it appears to me that the debate between Huntington and Garfield at least partly stems from this different understanding of Nagarjuna. Um, nevertheless, um, there is an important difference between reading Nagarjuna through the lenses of Buddhist epistemology and with the help of systems developed within Euro-American philosophical culture. However questionable is the alliance of the systems of Dharmakirti and Nagarjuna, it is the alliance of the two Buddhist systems that despite speaking different languages, and making different emphasis, share similar objectives and concerns, such as nirvana, and share similar basic ideas, such as the four truths. In contrast to that, interpretations stemming from the Western philosophical discourse, broadly, broadly speaking, uh, come from a different source, and as a result might be using vocabulary and ideas that are of little concern to Nagarjuna's Buddhist project. This in itself is not a problem at all, on the contrary, it can be of tremendous value for clarifying the nature of Nagarjuna's reasoning and other elements of his thought, as the contemporary scholarship on Nagarjuna aptly demonstrates. <clears throat> Nevertheless, if those interpretations stop there, they might be uh, insufficient for understanding Nagarjuna as a Buddhist thinker pursuing Buddhist soteriological um, objectives. Both early and contemporary interpreters of Nagarjuna participate in the same creative struggle of trying to understand and explain the thinker whose work challenges all attempts to do so. Competing interpretations by, by such interpreters as Shakespeare and Zonkava, for example, inspired generations of later scholars from different backgrounds to refine all and find new ways of understanding Nagarjuna. Competing interpretations by contemporary scholars like Huntington and Garfield have likewise inspired us to participate in this symposium in hopes of developing a better understanding of Nagarjuna. But no matter how dif uh, differently we understand Nagarjuna's philosophy and what different tools we bring to its interpretation, if we decide to use this, uh, the deconstructive reasoning he himself left for us in his Mola Madhyama Kakarika, we can arrive at fundamentally the same destination or understanding aimed at by his soteriological project. Thank you. Yes.